last night the official rise of kingdom social media accounts revealed that we're going to be getting three new legendary commanders coming soon to the game these three teaser images were revealed and myself as well as others scrambled to make a video as fast as possible because well we're content creators that's what we do and in the haste of making that video i didn't have that much time to do a lot of research into who i think these three commanders might be so this video is going to be a more in-depth analysis about everything we know about these commanders and i'm going to give you guys all of the evidence for why I think they are who they are and I also want to point out that I'm pretty sure the rise of kingdoms community figured out exactly who the shore stone shield commander actually is we're going to revisit the disarm mechanic we're going to talk about when these commanders are going to come and then later in the video I'm going to give you guys sort of my detailed analysis as to what I think about ranged commanders in rise of kingdoms and why they might not be that popular and how this may or may not affect free to play players but first what's going on guys cheers this is the second coffee of the day now before we jump in about 69 percent of you guys are not subscribed so consider doing that down below and dropping a thumbs up while you're down there also kingdom 2790 is actually recruiting for their next kvk and just to be clear they did not pay me to promote their kingdom i have fought alongside these guys in previous kvks they have some really impressive players over there and it looks like they're looking for about two spots for some crazy field fighters all the information you're going to need is on the screen here as well as the qr code in the bottom if you want to join their discord to see if it might be a good fit for you and also i'll put the link to their discord down below and as a reminder there's a link to my discord down there as well if you want to come and talk about these new potential commanders I would love to have you guys over there now the first thing I want to go over in this video is a correction to my previous video that I made at literally midnight so my brain was not working but I said that the active skill on El Cid had the disarm mechanic and I could have sworn in the battle reports for El Cid when he's fighting and cast his active skill but after I posted that video I checked the battle log here and it turns out that it's the restriction effect from the active skill on El Cid. I could have sworn it said disarm and I'm not crazy because Chiskel also thought the same thing. So I don't understand if this is some sort of Mandela effect or something like that. I have no clue. The fact that Chiskel and I both thought this was a disarm mechanic is actually crazy to me, but the real disarm mechanic can be understood by looking at Artemisia's third skill. And if you click on the disarm mechanic here, it says prevents a troop from launching basic attacks so this will not prevent them from launching a active skill like a silence effect from Guan Yu for example so disarming is not as good as silencing as I alluded to in the previous video so I just wanted to make it very clear that I was wrong about that what does this mean well disarming the target means that if they can't do basic attacks that means they also can't probably generate rage for that turn as far as I remember correctly which at this point I guess I shouldn't trust my memory from a few years ago when I last looked at this stuff but I'm pretty sure that if you don't do a basic attack you don't generate rage for that turn so the disarm mechanic that we know is on these new commanders and in case you missed my previous video the way that we know that two of these commanders have the disarm ability is because it literally says it in the description of the official rise of kingdoms post so we know that one of the ranged commanders and also the leadership commander are going to have the disarm mechanic on at least one of their skills it could be their active skill it could be an instant proc thing so it's gonna be really interesting to see how the disarm mechanic affects things I'm pretty sure Artemisia is the only one that has the disarm mechanic I could be wrong about that you can let me know in the comment section below but I just wanted to clarify exactly what disarming actually does in rise of kingdoms all right next let's go over when we might expect to see these commanders land in rise of kingdoms because every time there's sort of a sneak peek of new commanders coming to the game everybody feels like oh my god it's so soon we just got new commanders guys listen a sneak peek for a commander does not mean that it's going to come into the game this week or next week or something like that okay I need everyone to calm down we got Herman prime the first day you could recruit him was on the 2nd of january which by the way i predicted that in my video before he even came out so i was right about that i'm happy to see that so what do we typically know about commander release cycles well usually unless there's some sort of anomaly we usually see them between 70 and 84 days apart okay so if we see that herman prime was unlockable or first came into the game his first wheel of fortune was on January 2nd now, January 2nd was a Tuesday at least in my time zone which means if we add 70 days to that that means the first time we will see the wheel of fortune commander release would be either March 12th or we might expect it the following cycle which would be March 26th now again this is my speculation I guess the soonest we would see them would be the 27th of this month but I really just doubt that I, I don't think that's gonna be the case I really feel like all the evidence suggests that these commanders will come into the game on either March 12th 
or on March 26th. Now there's one other thing that we have to keep in mind, however, and that is the fact that there are three of these new commanders. And what happens when we got three commanders the last time? Well, last time we got three commanders, it was also for the ranged release with Bobber and Margaret and also Heraclius. And one of those commanders, particularly Margaret came in the form of an event. And so I think we can expect that one of these commanders might actually come in the form of an event. And if that is the case, perhaps one of these commanders could come into the game a little bit earlier than the rest of them. So I just want to be very clear with that. This isn't your typical release because there are more commanders than usual. Usually we get one mightiest governor commander and one wheel of fortune commander. This will probably follow in the same footsteps as last year with one event commander. Okay. So now that I've explained that I expect these commanders to come into the game at the same pace that we've always seen new commanders. Okay. People always feel like they're coming faster, but I don't care what you feel like. Just look at the data. The data is that most commanders come in the same time frame every single time. So assuming that that will continue to be the case for this release, which I could be wrong, what should free to play players do about this? Right? Because I know that even 70 days, right? Like let's say they do come in 70 days. That would be the March 12th date. Then, you know, 70 days could still feel pretty fast for free to play players. And I totally get that. Okay. But here's the good news for free to play players. Okay. When they released Bobber, Margaret and Heraclius into the game, that was basically like a delay for free to play players from the meta. What do I mean by this? Well, neither, none of these commanders no, of all three of them, zero of them were worth investing in for free to play players because ranged just isn't a thing. And I'm going to talk about that later in this video. And there's a long list of reasons why I think ranged is not a thing. So I'm going to go in depth into all of that, but this new release with these ranged smite damage commanders. And I'm also going to talk about who I think these commanders are, and we have a lot of evidence for it, but I think this is probably going to be another cycle that free to play players can just skip and feel good about that. Now I could be wrong again, this is all speculation, but if we look at what happened last year with the ranged commanders and engineering commanders, engineering commanders are not for free to play players. And historically they haven't been very good either. Okay. And we also know that the leadership commander coming into the game is also a garrison and skill damage commander. And so if it is at all anything like Heraclius, which it could be more powerful than Heraclius. Okay. Because we have the skill tree, which means he could be dealing a lot of skill damage. It could be the case, but I also feel like if it's a garrison commander, it's probably going to be really slow in the open field. I mean, every time we see a new garrison commander, how often do you see a lot of March speed on a garrison commander? It's basically never, you can go through the game. You can look at all the stats yourself. We never really see March speed there. And typically March speed is one of the defining factors for whether or not a commander is good in the open field. Now I know like Gorgo, for example, is like an exception and there are some other exceptions as well. But for the most part, garrison commanders typically aren't used in open field meta, right? And so if we can extrapolate that information, plus what we know about Heraclius, which is kind of last year's version of what we're getting this time, then we can kind of assume that the new leadership commander might not really be worth investing in either for free to play players. Okay. So again, this could be, this could change when we see their skills. And of course we don't have that information at the time of me recording this video, but the good news and the silver lining about a release of engineering and ranged commanders is that free to play players can skip most likely skip this cycle and feel okay about that and feel like they're not missing out on the meta. Meanwhile, engineering commanders this time around, if they are better than last year, then this could be something that whales could work on as a supplementary project to what they've already got going with their six and seven marches and whether or not that's worth it. We can figure out it when the skills are actually revealed and when testing is actually done. But I just don't want free to play players to freak out and be like, oh my God, we're getting new commanders already. We just got Harmon prime. Like, yes, maybe it feels fast, but you probably can skip these commanders and you probably won't feel bad about that at all. It, it'll probably be a really good option actually to skip these for free to play. But of course, as soon as the skills come out, we will cover them in a video and you definitely want to be subscribed with the bell turned on for that news. All right. Now that we've gone over everything that I feel like was missing from my original video covering these commanders, let's go more in depth as to who I actually think these commanders are, what the evidence is to support that. And then we'll talk more about ranged in just a minute. Now, this was the first image that we saw on the social media accounts from rise of kingdoms. Okay. And I personally think that this commander is almost a hundred percent guaranteed to be Gaja Mada. Now I did mention this in my first video covering this, 
but pretty much all the evidence suggests that because they hinted at this being the Jernad Hara again sorry for the mispronunciation but if you look that up Gajamata is the only historical figure that comes to mind and he is a powerful military leader who was in power in the mid 1300s in what is I guess currently Indonesia and so I took that information that I feel pretty confident in and just to be clear like this is all my speculation okay until these commanders are in the game all of this is just my assumption speculation and I think it's fun to theory craft okay but I took that information that I feel like is pretty strong and I had AI generate some artwork as to what this commander might look like in rise of kingdoms now i have no idea how accurate this would be for gajamata as a sort of ancient indonesian uh, warrior okay i think the uh the the arm things here like this maybe doesn't make that much sense historically but i'm gonna be real i'm not using some super fancy ai tools here okay i'm just using like mid journey with some simple prompts but based on the prompts that i put in this is what mid journey thinks that gajamata might look like in the style of rise of kingdoms now of course we know that rise of kingdoms commanders typically have much thinner legs here although for this guy it seems like he doesn't okay so there you go now the other thing too is he's obviously holding some sort of either scroll or book or maybe a tablet or something like that like an ancient tablet not like an ipad and i couldn't get them to replicate that over here in the ai artwork i actually have no idea what this even is this looks like it's some sort of possible sword or something like that like maybe the sword juts out here and we'll we'll see that when the silhouette is actually fully revealed but this is what AI spit out. Now let's take a look at father of the Tercio. And again, I probably am mispronouncing that as well. And in my original video, we had a couple of different people that it could be, but based on the comments that you guys left on my video, it seems like Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba is probably the most likely candidate because he was literally called El Gran Capitan, the great captain because of his role as the father of the Tercios. So I think again, this one is pretty much set in stone. I feel like the evidence here is pretty strong. I feel like historically speaking, there's really only one person in history who would fit this description really well. And that is Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordova. So I did the same thing. I took that information and I put it into AI and this is what they spit out. And I think, you know, I, I tried to ask it to have him holding a scroll. It looks like he's holding a scroll here. They gave us a pamphlet or a book, which I don't know i guess ai doesn't know what a scroll is of course his hand doesn't look very good over here but i do think it kind of nailed the hat here i think that makes a lot of sense it looks like this guy probably has either a really big beard or he has long hair that you can see from the front which is not replicated over here at all but i also think the wardrobe here isn't like completely outrageous either i think like this could be something that we see in rise of kingdom so this is what ai thinks gonzalo fernandez de cordoba might look like when and if he comes to rise of kingdoms but the final question was the shore stone shield this was the one that i was very confused about i didn't know at all who this could possibly be but i think a lot of comments and a lot of you guys helped me figure this out so thank you thank you thank you and there are a couple of hints in this silhouette that give us a really good idea as to who this could be first of all there's clearly some sort of sword or machete or a long knife that he's holding over his shoulder okay there's also clearly some sort of what appears to be a shield that he's leaning on top of it could be a pillar it could be something else as far as like his design or his aesthetic or something like that but it's probably a sword and a shield and there's some interesting characteristics of these two pieces of equipment first of all the handle here splits into two at what appears to be the base and the tip does not come to a perfect point it actually looks more like a sort of slanted machete point here uh as if it would come here and then go down as a as a slant okay and also the shield appears to be more of a rectangular shape with some banding in the center top and bottom of the shield and a lot of you guys mentioned that the sword looked like a silhouette of a compilan now i definitely am probably mispronouncing that but my understanding is that this is a traditional filipino blade and i think if you look at this and you compare it to what we have in the picture i think there's a lot of similarities i think you see that the hilt of the blade splits in two here i think that is exactly what we see in the standard parts of a compilan and also the way that the blade is shaped here it comes to an an angled point and I think that that is probably what we're seeing here at the tip of the blade so I think that that is a very strong argument in favor of the sword and to support that the silhouette of the shield 
looks like a Kalasag, which again, sorry for the pronunciation, but this is a large rectangular wooden shield used by pre-colonial Filipinos. So, okay, we now have two pieces of evidence to suggest that this could be a Filipino commander. And if we take a look at what some of these uh, shields actually looked like, I think the resemblance is kind of shocking. Okay. In particular, like this one over here and this one on the left. Plus you see uh, some of those same swords here, the Kampilan swords. If you look at the shield here, it's the same form factor. It is rectangular. It has the wooden bands on the top, middle and bottom. And I really don't think that this is a coincidence. Both the weapon and the shield bearing strong resemblances to Filipino weapons or Filipino equipment suggests that this could be a Filipino commander. So, okay, well, what else do we know? Well, they call him the shore stone shield. Okay. And a lot of you mentioned that this suggests this commander is none other than Lapu Lapu, who is arguably the most famous Filipino warrior and chief who was known for the 1521 battle of Mactan, where he and his men defeated Spanish forces led by Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan and his native allies. If we take a look at this 3d render that depicts Lapu Lapu, you're going to see some really familiar silhouettes. You see the shield, you see the sword. These look identical to what we see in the rides of kingdoms silhouettes, but there's more evidence than just that because there's some really cool folklore behind the story of Lapu Lapu. According to local legend, Lapu Lapu never died, but was turned into stone and has since then been guarding the seas of Mactan. So when we come back to his description as the shore stone shield, I feel like everything comes together, right? Because he was the shield for his people. He defended his people against the Portuguese invasion. And if he turned into stone and has since been guarding the seas, then to me, that sounds like a shore stone. So we have like four pieces of solid evidence to suggest that this could be Lapu Lapu. So I asked AI to generate some artwork as to what Lapu Lapu might look like in rise of kingdoms. And this is what we got. Honestly, it's not perfect. Okay. It's not perfect. He's like not even holding the shield. Okay. But I think that we've got some sort of top bun here for the hair, which I think is probably pretty accurate between the two. It looks like he has long hair from what you can see here. So I, you know, had long hair on the artwork. I don't know why they have like leaves around him. I'm not really sure what's going on there, but it does look like he has some sort of maybe skirt or like a tunic or something like that and has a little bit of armor around his shins, which we also see in the AI generated artwork. And what I find hilarious about this is that I made a video back in August of 2021 called five new commanders that should be added to rise of kingdoms and number two was lapu lapu and i even said that he should be a leadership support and garrison commander now as it turns out it looks like he's going to be leadership garrison and skill damage so i was really close i was like one talent tree off but i even said that his active skill should give him some sort of shield now i actually made up a new mechanic here because i thought that i was cool i'm still pretty cool and maybe rise of kingdoms will eventually steal this idea i mean who knows when we see the skills i could be right it could be a, a shield that actually converts into healing factor which i think would be really cool but just the fact that i said they should put him in the game like two and a half years ago and here we are possibly getting lapu lapu for the first time in rise of kingdoms it is so funny how that actually worked out i completely had no idea if they would ever actually put him into the game if it turns out that this is actually lapu lapu and he does have a shield in part of his active skill or something like that my prediction from two and a half years ago or at least my request from two and a half years ago is shockingly accurate and i mean what can i say what can i say i know the game well boys i know the game well if you guys want to know what's coming to the game two and a half years in advance you better subscribe to the channel now there's also one other thing that i want to mention here as some more evidence as to why i feel like these three are the commanders that we will be getting for rise of kingdoms and the reason for that is because of this social media post that we see here from the beginning or i guess i should say the end of january so this was a couple of weeks ago we see the official rise of kingdoms twitter account and also they posted this on facebook instagram and the forums but they said governors commanders play a pivotal role in rise of kingdoms which historical figure deserves a spot in the game leave your suggestions in the comments and i'm going to share with you guys the top geographies that watch my videos and here you go in the last year 20.6 percent of my viewers came from the united states but in second place 
is 7.1% of them came from the Philippines. And in third place, we have 6.4% coming from Indonesia. So what we can learn, at least from my demographics, is that there are a lot of Filipino players and there are a lot of Indonesian players. So would it not make sense that a lot of the answers that Rise of Kingdoms got from this questionnaire were requests for Indonesian commanders and for Filipino commanders, right? I think that logically makes sense. If that's a big part of the community and we don't have any commanders from those regions yet, wouldn't it make sense for them to add a famous historical Filipino chief? Wouldn't it make sense for them to add a famous Indonesian military strategist? I think that all of the evidence suggests that we're going to be seeing Gajamata, Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba, and Lapu Lapu coming to Rise of Kingdoms. All right, so that is all of the evidence that I have to suggest the true identity of these three new commanders coming to Rise of Kingdoms. But what does this mean for the meta? Well, there's a couple couple of things that we can assume first of all for Lapu Lapu okay we know that he's a garrison and skill tree commander but we also know that shield is in his description okay and he's also holding a shield now of course not every commander holding a shield in rise of kingdoms actually has shielding factor like we see on for example Heraclius in fact Heraclius isn't even holding a shield and yet he has the mighty shielding factor on his active skill but I think that if we look at Lapu Lapu being a skill tree commander who also is the shore stone shield, it's possible that he could be dealing AOE skill damage, which we already know is the case because they, well, they literally already confirmed it. Okay. We know that he's going to have AOE skill damage and a disarm of course. And that sounds like it could be very similar to Heraclius who also has AOE skill damage and a shield. So we actually could see the literal perfect pair for Heraclius coming in the form of Lapu Lapu. Like they could actually have perfect synergy because the mighty shielding factor, the reason that this is called a mighty shield and not just a regular shield like we see on Charles Martel, for example, is that the mighty shield can stack on top of a regular shielding factor. And so if both Lapu Lapu and Heraclius have AOE skill damage and really solid shielding factor, and they're both leadership garrison commanders, could we actually see a leadership garrison meta is that actually possible or is this going to be another one of those things where Lapu Lapu is really strong for defending his city and not as good for defending flags which by the way Heraclius can be used as a secondary for defending flags he's actually quite good there so Lapu Lapu could be as well but I think it would make sense if we look at the battle for Mactan and the sort of historical significance of Lapu Lapu I think it would make sense that he would be a city garrison commander right? Like he is literally famous for protecting his own people. So it's also possible that we could have Heraclius and Lapu Lapu be like the perfect city garrison. It could be like literally built as a match made in heaven to be the perfect way to defend your city. They could both have shielding and AOE damage. It would actually be insane. So I think there could be some synergy there. And I think that there is some precedent and evidence for that. Now, remember, we also know that the two ranged commanders are ranged smite damage commanders. One of them is healing and one of them also has the disarm. And I think in particular for Gaja Mata, they might have really interesting synergy with Margaret. And why is that? Well, Margaret also is a ranged commander, first of all. But if you look at her active skill, it says for the next three seconds, this commander's troop deals 50% more ranged normal damage. And if we assume that ranged smite damage is going to behave just like regular smite damage, then what we can assume is that ranged normal damage is going to be the modifier for the ranged smite damage. Remember, smite damage scales off of normal damage, so ranged smite damage probably scales off of ranged normal damage, right? So if you have Margaret primary with Gajamata secondary, then Gajamata's smite damage skill will trigger during the three seconds of this 50% damage bonus. So if that damage is at all reasonable, then it could literally pop off. And also you're dealing extra range damage here with Margaret, which is nice. Further than that, if you look at Margaret's expertise here, it says whenever your troops take damage, you have a 10% chance to recover a portion of its slightly wounded units with a 500 healing factor. And we know there's some healing factor on Gaja Mata as well. So now you'll have two engineering ranged commanders, one of which is going to boost the damage of Gaja Mata and both of which are going to have some really nice healing factor potentially. So this could be another possible pair 
or margaret now i also wanted to say that if both of these new commanders are smite damage commanders it's possible that their synergy together is just far and away better than anything you would get from margaret or from bobber but i do think like this is a really big damage bonus guys 50 percent more damage for the active skill on gajamata like oh my god could ranged actually be broken in 2024. okay now i'm gonna make one more prediction and that's gonna be which of these commanders is the wheel of fortune commander which one is the mightiest governor commander and which one could potentially be the event commander okay now if you take a look and this is really like i'm kind of stretching in here a little bit but if you take a look at the instagram account for rise of kingdoms and also subsequently the social media accounts like twitter and facebook and all that stuff oftentimes what they will reveal first is the wheel of fortune commander which is really interesting but we see that be the case with juge leong was listed first in the reveal for him and dito huo was revealed first before justinian liu che was revealed before gorgo herman was revealed before asher Bonapal. and if we go all the way back to last year's release of the ranged commanders bobber was listed before margaret so based on that trend it seems like the first commander listed and revealed is typically the wheel of fortune commander and so gaja mata in my mind is probably going to be the wheel of fortune commander and then last year we saw the mightiest governor commander was the leadership commander right and so i think it is likely to repeat this year in that i think lapu lapu will probably be a mightiest governor commander which leaves gonzalo fernandez de cordoba to be the event commander for this upcoming commander release that is just my deduction skills at work there based on the trend we've seen on their social media. So this could be completely wrong. I have no idea. And I kind of hope that it's wrong because I really want Lapu Lapu to be a commander that everybody gets their hands on. I feel like this is a commander people have been asking for for a long time, especially because the Filipino community is so big in Rise of Kingdoms. And so I really hope that Lapu Lapu is the Wheel of Forging commander. Okay, now the last thing I want to cover in this video is how I currently see ranged commanders in the meta and why I feel like free to play players can comfortably skip this upcoming cycle, knowing that it is ranged commanders. Okay. The first thing we have to look at is equipment and the equipment for siege is actually quite good because it is all level 50. When you're looking at the legendary gear. Now, I just want to remind you guys, there is actually epic siege equipment in the game. I know a lot of people forgot about that, but the Knights set does exist and somehow it's not actually a set like they're all knights pieces they're all called knights something but there's no set bonus here and there's it's not actually considered a set in the game so lilith i don't know what you're doing there but if you want to help siege you can give them an epic set with set bonuses that would make a lot of sense you've already made it literally a set so like why not but anyway if you look at the lupine vestments here this is a siege unit set and what you'll notice is that it is just as expensive as all of the other equipment here okay all the other equipment if you look at like legendary helmets it's always 60. if you look at the legendary helmet here it is also 60. now the other thing is that there is no six piece set bonus siege don't have weapons there's no weapon for siege yes you heard me right now of course you have like the gathering weapons and you've got like i don't know the scepter of the glorious goddess here or you could run like maybe witch's feathered staff maybe you would just run the knight's oath sworn bow right that's possible this is probably your best choice to be honest with you guys but you have to make a significant investment of materials into this legendary set only to not get a 6p set bonus and you're not even using your animal bones right if you look at you know some of the other um, siege sets okay these are obviously gathering sets but they use uh animal bones and you would think that they would continue that trend and make all the siege sets use some amount of animal bones right like maybe not fully but we don't see that there is no animal bones here at all it is all expensive materials that you would typically care a lot about and also it literally costs more gold okay uh it's because it's a level 50 set which means it gives more stats okay which siege desperately need we're going to talk about that in a second but it's 50 percent more gold 50 percent more gold for siege equipment that's crazy that is a massive barrier to entry in a world where getting these blueprints competes with getting blueprints for your other troop types by that i mean are you going to use the conquest blueprint fragment choice chest on siege gear or gear that you actually can make good use out of furthermore we have the iconic tier system now in the game and that means you're going to have to get even more copies of these blueprints to level up the iconic tier here and so again it's just another layer of blueprint investment 
on top of needing blueprints for all the other troop types that really move the needle and on top of all that you have to run the v formation in order to use ranged combat okay you literally have no other choice and so when you're getting armaments for your v formation any stat that isn't siege is going in the garbage which is actually kind of crazy so there's literally only one troop type that you care about when opening up or or acquiring v formation armaments whereas if you're talking about arch formation or particularly wedge formation you care about any troop type right like let's say i get a really good archer armament like well maybe i didn't necessarily want one but i could still use it and likewise if instead i got a really good cavalry armament well i could still use that on something else but if i get a really good archer cav or infantry armament for v formation all of that goes in the garbage because I will never use it. So it is actually harder to get good siege armaments than it is for any other troop type because it is limited to one formation only. So again, this is really expensive, just like the equipment. But okay, let's take a step back here and ask ourselves, why aren't we using siege, right? Like as a troop type, why have we always historically ignored siege entirely is it because they have lower stats well actually no they have the same stats as any other generic troop type okay you have 220 base attack 216 base defense 212 base health and you can see the multipliers are pretty high they're pretty much the same as you would see from any other troop type even if we come over to generic infantry 220 212 216 okay same sort of multipliers here as well so it's not like siege have lower attack defense or health but they do have a few tremendous things working against them first of all their march speed they are literally the slowest troop type in the entire game now they've tried to supplement this fact by giving you a lot of march speed on the legendary set here okay you'll see that every single piece here has some amount of siege march speed okay so i mean it makes sense that they're going to give a lot more of a bonus there because of how slow siege are but historically like in order to even use this you're saying you need a legendary set like that really sucks right like that's awful and even still it's so slow that those percentage increases um you know the fact that it is a percentage of your base stats and you're multiplying the lowest possible march speed in the entire game you are a sitting duck most of the time furthermore there are no siege specific civilizations in rise of kingdoms there are literally none we have multiple civilizations for each troop type except for siege there are no siege special units now that could change in this upcoming release i know they've already hinted at a new civilization coming in 2024 i think a lot of people have already deduced that it is probably the mayans that will be coming in the summer we don't know for sure but that is what a lot of the evidence suggests and perhaps that new civilization will be a siege focused civilization however uh, at the current time we have nothing now of course we do have like france for example which gives you generic health but that doesn't make up for the fact that there are no special units for siege so there's no like there's no civilization that you could pick to get more base stats for your siege and i think that that is a big problem so you're technically at a slight disadvantage already but the biggest problem of all is shown in this little chart right here it's called city destruction counters watchtowers but is countered by infantry archer and cavalry units siege are literally countered by every other troop type in the game so in other words they take more damage from and i think also deal less damage to and i could be wrong about that every troop type in the game they are literally countered by every troop, troop type in the game so you're talking about the slowest unit in the game with no special unit and is countered by everybody so great news you are the most swarmable troop in the game and you're probably going to have fewer stats and everyone's dealing more damage to you and you can't get away because you're march speed and on top of all that if you are using the ranged formation that means that you're locked in place you are stuck in place if somebody gets to you if they reach your troops you're countered by everybody and you can't get away you're just you're getting destroyed you are getting destroyed but despite all of that okay even if they fixed all of that even if they gave more march speed to siege and they gave them a civilization with a special unit and they made it so they weren't countered by any troop types the number one problem with engineering commanders and with ranged combat is that it's boring bro 
it's so boring it is the most boring way to play rise of kingdoms by far you literally sit in one spot on the map and you just sit there and hope someone comes close enough to you otherwise you have to spend a significant amount of time dismantling your tower walking somewhere else really slow by the way and then setting up your tower again and i'm not saying people don't do this and i know that some people do it and you do get good results and it's nice like chip damage at, at a distance i get all that right there is some strategic advantage to it but it's still really boring compared to actual open field fighting and so why would players do it why would players choose to play a much more boring and passive play style it's less exciting it's not as fun and like i just described siege units are the worst units in the game so because of all of that because the equipment is so expensive and because the payoff is so low with the most boring play style in the game i think it is safe to assume that free to play players can probably just skip this upcoming smite damage ranged commanders and they're probably going to be fine with that right now again this is all speculation and i could be completely wrong and when the skills get revealed i will cover them right away on this youtube channel and so if you don't want to miss that consider subscribing and clicking the bell to be notified the next time that i post that video but more than likely free to play players can breathe a breath of fresh air and of relief because they won't need to invest heavily in these commanders that is my prediction that is what i think will be the case and if you're a mega well perhaps you know if you've got the armaments and you've got the equipment maybe this upcoming release is going to be for you and it's going to fit in your seven march lineup and it's going to be popping off but i suspect that it might not be the case and truthfully i hope that it's not because i think if range commanders get too strong that's going to break the meta and it's not going to be fair your whales are going to be able to destroy you at a distance you can't even get close and i don't want the game to descend down that path i don't think that'll be fun for anybody anyway guys this video was way longer than i thought it would be if you made it all the way to the end of the video i hope you'll drop a thumbs up on it it really helps out the channel a ton and it helps get this video out into the youtube algorithm so other rise of kingdom players might see it while you're down there comment down below who you think these new commanders are do you think my evidence is strong enough to suggest that we are right about this and when i say we i don't mean just me i mean you guys really helped with your comments so let me know how accurate you think i am in the comments section below and while you're down there like i said before consider subscribing to the channel and clicking the bell to be notified the next time i upload a rise of kingdoms video and join my discord for more discussions about new commanders the link will be in the description below with that being said guys thank you so much for watching this has been omniarch i will talk to you guys again soon peace